Section 3 of The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Science, History of the Universe, Volume 2, edited by Francis Rolt Wheeler. Geology, Chapter 2, The Beginnings of Cartography, Part 1. In the ancient records, there is considerable doubt as to who were the earliest voyagers. Some authorities uphold the claims of the Greeks, some the Phoenicians, others the Egyptians, and still others the Chinese. Advocates of the Chinese claim base their conclusion on the location of the Ark of Noah. It is alleged that the Ark rested on one of the mountains of Armenia, and that Scythia was the first land to be inhabited, it being of high altitude and therefore the first to appear after the flood. But such an argument, based upon a local tradition, not upon scientific evidence, has little force. Mankind, at least that portion whose history is familiar, dwelt upon the borders of an inland Mediterranean sea. They had never heard of such an expanse of water as the Atlantic, and certainly had never seen it. The landlocked sheet which lay spread out at their feet was at all times full of mystery and often even of dread and secret misgiving. Those who ventured forth upon its bosom came home and told marvelous tales of the sights they had seen and the perils they had endured. Homer's heroes returned to Ithaca with the music of the sirens in their ears and the cruelties of the giants upon their lips. The Argonauts saw whirling rocks implanted in the sea to warn and repel the approaching navigator, and as if the mystery of the waters had tinged with fable even the dry land beyond it, they filled the Caucasus with wild stories of enchantresses, of bulls that breathed fire, and of a race of men that sprang like a ripened harvest from the prolific soil. If the ancients were ignorant of the shape of the earth, it was for the very reason they were ignorant of the ocean. Their geographers and philosophers, whose observations were confined to fragments of Europe, Asia, and Africa, alternately made the world a cylinder, a flat surface begirt by water, a drum, a boat, a disc. The legends that sprang from these confused and contradictory notions made the land a scene of marvels and the water an abode of terrors. It is now generally conceded that the date of the maritime enterprises which rendered the Phoenicians famous in antiquity must be fixed between the years 1700 and 1100 BC. The renowned city of Sidon was the center from which their expeditions were sent forth. About 1250 BC, their ships ventured cautiously beyond the Straits of Gibraltar and founded Cadiz upon a coast washed by the Atlantic. A little later, they founded establishments upon the western coast of Africa. Homer asserts that at the Trojan War, 1194 BC, the Phoenicians furnished the belligerents with many articles of luxury and convenience, and their ships brought gold to Solomon from Ophir in 1000 BC. About the period of Tyre's greatness, 600 BC, the Phoenicians, though under Egyptian commanders, appear to have succeeded in the circumnavigation of Africa. The enterprise was undertaken by order of Nico, king of Egypt, and is commented on by Herodotus as follows. Having in this manner consumed two years, in the third they passed the pillars of Hercules and returned to Egypt. This story may be believed by others, but to me it appears incredible, for they affirm that when they sailed round Libya, they had the sun on their right hand. In the time of Herodotus, the Greeks were unacquainted with the phenomenon of a shadow falling to the south, one which the Phoenicians would naturally have witnessed had they actually passed the Cape of Good Hope, for the sun would have been on their right hand, or in the north, and would thus have projected shadows to the south. As this story was not one likely to have been invented in the time of Nico, suggests F. B. Goodrich in his Man Upon the Sea, from which some of these adventures are condensed, it is the strongest proof that could be adduced of the reality of the voyage. The first maritime adventure among the Greeks which lays any claim to authenticity, and the most celebrated in ancient times, is the expedition of the Argonauts to Colchis. The date of the expedition, if it took place at all, may be safely fixed at the year 1250 BC. A theory propounded by Sir Isaac Newton would connect it with the year 937, but this is regarded with less favor than the earlier date. Its alleged object was the Golden Fleece, but what this was can only be conjectured. Jason, the son of the King of Thessaly, being deprived of his inheritance and having resolved to seek his fortune by some remote and hazardous expedition, was induced to go in quest of the Golden Fleece in Colchis. He enlisted fifty men and employed Argus to build him a ship, which from him was called Argo, the adventurers being named Argonauts. The Argonauts started their voyage from Iolcos in Thessaly, and with a south wind sailed east by north. The narrative of the expedition is full of wonders. 
They landed at the island of Lemnos, where they found that the women had just murdered their husbands and fathers. The Argonauts supplied the place of the assassinated relatives, and Jason had two sons by one of the bereaved Lemnians. When the vessel arrived at the entrance to the Euxane, the narrow strait now called the Bosphorus, they built a temple and implored the protection of gods against the Symplegades, or whirling rocks, which guarded the passage. A seer named Phineas was consuited upon the probability of their sailing through unharmed. The rocks were imagined to float upon the waves, and when anything attempted to pass through, to seize and crush it. Phineas advised the loosing of a dove to judge from its fate of the destiny reserved for them. They did so, determined to push boldly on if the bird got through in safety. The pigeon escaped with the loss of some of its tail feathers. The Argo dashed onward and cleared the formidable rocks with the loss of a few of its stern ornaments. From this time forward, the legend adds, the simple goddess remained fixed and were no longer a terror to navigators. The Argonauts, after entering the Black Sea, sailed due east to the mouth of the river Phasis, now the Rione. Aedes, the king, promised to give Jason the fleece upon certain conditions. These he was enabled to fulfill by the aid of Medea, a sorceress and daughter of Aedes. They then fled together to Greece. This route, followed by the Argonauts upon their return, is differently given by the various poets who have told the story and the commentators who have illustrated it. The Greeks, like the Hebrews, were ignorant of the real figure of the earth. It is in Homer that is found the first written trace of the widely prevalent idea that the earth is a flat surface begirt on every side by the ocean. This was a natural belief in a region almost insular, like Greece, where the visible horizon and an enveloping sea suggested the idea of a flat circle. Homer took the lead among the poetic geographers of Greece, and his authority gave to the subject a fanciful cast, the traces of which are not yet obliterated. Beneath the earth, he placed the fabled regions of Elysium and Tartarus. Above the whole rose the grand arch of the heavens, which were supposed to rest on the summits of the highest mountains. The sun, moon, and stars were believed to rise from the waves of the sea and to sink again beneath them on the return from the skies. Homer's distribution of the land was even more fantastic. Beyond the limits of Greece and the western coasts of Asia Minor, his knowledge was uncertain and obscure. He had heard vaguely of Thebes, the mighty capital of Egypt, and in his verse sang of its hundred gates and of the countless hosts it sent forth to battle. The Ethiopians, who lived beyond, were deemed to be the most remote dwellers upon the habitable earth. Toward the center of Africa were the stupendous ridges of the Atlas Mountains. Homer defined the highest peak and made it a giant, supporting upon his shoulders the outspreading canopy of the heavens. The narrow passage leading from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic, and now known as the Straits of Gibraltar, was believed to have been discovered by Hercules, and the mountains on either side, Gibraltar and Queda, were, from him, called the Pillars of Hercules. Colchos, upon the Black Sea, was believed to be an ocean city, and here, Greek fancy, located the Palace of the Sea. It was here that the charioteer of the skies gave rest to his coursers during the night, and from whence in the morning he drove them forth again. Colchos, therefore, was Homer's eastern confine of the globe. On the north, Rhodope, or the Rypean Mountains, were supposed to enclose the Hyperborean limits of the world. Beyond them dwelt a fabled race, seated in the recesses of their valleys and sheltered from the contests of the elements. They were represented as exempt from all ills, physical and moral, from sickness, the changes of the seasons, and even from death. A race directly the converse of the ideal Hyperboreans were the Chimerians, located at the south of the Sea of Azov, who are described by Homer as dwelling in perpetual darkness and never visited by the sun. He imagines the existence of numerous other nations who long continued to hold a place in ancient geography. The Cyclops, who had but one eye, were placed in Sicily. The Arimaspians, similarly affected, inhabited the frontiers of India, the Pygmies, or Dwarves, who fought pitched battles with the cranes, were supposed to dwell in Africa, in India, and in fact, to occupy the whole southern border of the earth. In the time of Homer, says F. B. Goodrich again, all voyages in which the mariner lost sight of land were considered as fraught with the extremest peril. No navigator ever visited Africa or Sicily from choice, but only when driven there by tempest and typhoon, and then his woes usually terminated in shipwreck. A return was not merely a marvel, but a miracle. Homer made Sicily the principal scene of the lamentable adventures of Ulysses, and sufficient traces are furnished by the Odyssey of the distorted and exaggerated notions entertained in the poet's time of the character of places reached by a voyage at sea.
The existence of monsters of frightful form and size, such as Polyphemus, of treacherous enchantresses such as Circe, of amiable goddesses like Calypso, were prefigured by the early geographers and the location of their homes marked on the early charts. The radius of the territories described by Homer with any degree of precision was hardly three miles in length. Hesiod, who lived a century after Homer, thus states the scientific attainments of his time. The space between the heavens and the earth is exactly the same as that between the earth and Tartarus beneath it. A brazen anvil, if tossed from heaven, would fall during nine days and nine nights and would reach the earth upon the tenth day. Were it to continue its course toward the abode of darkness, it would be nine days and nine nights more in accomplishing the distance. Anaximander, four hundred years after Homer, held that the earth, instead of being flat, was in the form of a cylinder, convex upon its upper surface. Its diameter was three times greater than its height, and its form was round, as if it had been shaped by a turner's lathe. The oracle of Delphi was the center of his system. At a period which is no longer possible to settle with precision, but certainly anterior to 5th century BC, the Carthaginians, then in the height of their maritime and commercial prosperity, ordered a navigator by the name of Hanno to make a voyage beyond the Pillars of Hercules and to found cities along the western shore of Africa. He set sail with a fleet of 60 vessels, each of which was impelled by 50 oars. He carried with him 30,000 men and women with abundant supplies and provisions. The narrative, as given by Hanno himself, hardly fills two octavo pages. Volumes of commentaries have been written upon it by geographers and antiquaries. The most probable of the various hypotheses formed upon it is that Hanno's voyage extended to Sherbro Sound, a little south of Sierra Leone. The features of man and nature, as described by Hanno, are to be found in tropical Africa only. End of section 3